Hello and welcome to the NewsX Sunday Guardian Roundtable. Well, this week we shall be discussing the rights of our soldiers. Why is it when there is supposing a clash between a rock throwing mob or even say uh, people who are chanting slogans against our country, the, the sympathy of the human rights activists is usually with the protester and rarely with our soldiers. Why is it that we as a country don't really honour our martyrs, whether it's in terms of memorials or even support for them or even respect for them at times? Joining me on the round table is Mr. Madhav Nalapath, Editorial Director of the Sunday Guardian, Commodore Uday Bhaskar, he is the Strategic Affairs Thinker and also the Director for the Society of Policy Studies, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, he is an independent Rajya Sabha MP and also more importantly he has done a lot of work for the soldiers' rights. He runs an NGO, Flags of Honour, which does a lot of work for the veterans, support for the families and he has also raised a lot of issues pertaining to soldiers in Parliament. And of course we have Mr. John Dayal, he is a human rights activist. Um, Rajiv, since you've been really vocal on this subject, would you agree with my statement or is it too much of a presumption? No, look, I, I, I don't particularly take offence to people who support uh, human rights at raising that issue. I think it is, it is a legitimate part of a discourse in a democracy that people raise issues of uh, human rights. And in, 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 an, in an environment where there, are, where there is violence, there is bound to be and there should be always the scrutiny about whether the security forces are following the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. So I particularly don't have a problem with people raising the issue of human rights. But of course I have an issue when it is raised without a context, without substance, without evidence, without facts. And when it is used as a weapon to blunt what legitimately security forces are doing. So then it becomes a problem. Uh, Mr. Alpat? Well, I just like to point out in Calcutta, for example, if a small car uh, hits a big car. Mm. It's always the big car person who's in trouble. So the pro problem is that, you know, the soldiers have got are heavily armed, they're uniformed, uh, the mobs are not. So there is a kind of a perception the mob is always the underdog. But in cl places like Kashmir, that's not the case at all. You've got 20 or 30 uh, security force personnel and they're overwhelmed by several hundred mob, uh, a huge mob, which is out to kill them. So in that kind of a situation, quite frankly, I think the Human Rights Association will have to look at the human rights of the security forces. Although I agree with, with Rajiv that in general, where it's a confrontation between the public and let's say the police or the armed police, generally I think it's the public that gets the worst of it. Governor Bhaskar, you know, uh, Professor Nalapad mentioned, you know, say a case like Kashmir, where, you know, soldiers were told to go soft. Of course, you know, it can be argued whether pellets was a soft option or not. But the mobs didn't stop, you know, there were rocks being thrown, there were, you know, it could also be argued, you know, that the soldiers were also had to use force at the end of the day to control the situation. Well, Priya, since we are talking about the rights of soldiers in India, and it is the 70th anniversary of Independence Day, I'd like to take a larger sort of context for this and say that today, 70 years after independence, the rights of the Indian soldier are shrinking within the democratic constitutional framework and they're also being trampled upon. And I would suggest that as far as the extensive deployment of the Indian army in particular, mm. in what we refer to in the jargon as low intensity conflict and IS, LIC and IS, that is internal security, particularly in Jammu and Kashmir, I think over the last few years, we have seen a situation where I would even go to the extent of saying that not only the professional rights of the soldier, but in some cases, even the human rights of some soldiers are not being acknowledged. Mm. And in some rare cases, they are being trampled upon. And I think that is something that needs to be looked at very objectively. But I do want to endorse what Rajiv has also said that in a democracy, the use of force hmm. by any organization, any arm of the state, whether it is the police, the paramilitary or the army, including the intelligence agencies, has to have that framework of legitimacy and rectitude. Where there is a transgression, it must be scrutinized. There is no, to my mind, there are no two views on that. But concurrently, I think the way in which we are proceeding, particularly in Jammu and Kashmir, placing the Indian army and to use that old adage, tying one hand yeah. behind them, you know, their back as they say, asking them to operate with one hand tied behind their back as they say, is I think not appropriate for the democratic norm as also for the use of force. Meaning that if the state has to use force, it must be for a certain purpose. And you can't, in a way, task the army and then say, sorry guys, you're on your own. That doesn't work. Um, Mr. Dal, can I bring you in this, and especially you know, in the context of the recent uh, riots in Kashmir? 
No, no, but why uh, we come to Kashmir, as he did, mm. at the end of an argument about human rights. And he's correctly identified that even soldiers, not even, but soldiers are also citizens. They have human rights. They have human rights, which first of all would say, if you're sending us to X place, are you equipping us for that? And mm. we have been faulted many, many times from Siachen to the Chinese border in the extreme east. Right. Are our soldiers equipped to be placed there? Do they have the wherewithal? Are they clothed properly? Is their tunic okay? Is their ammunition okay? Do they have adequate? So it begins with that. The second thing is when you put the army in action. The army is trained, whether it's the Navy or the Air Force. If you put them against Pakistan or against the IPKF or against China, or Burma, or Bangladesh, any of the neighbors, or you put them in a Gaza Strip long ago, or in the Congo, where soldiers. If you're placing them in a military situation, nobody, but nobody will say, why did you use X amount of ammunition? Why did you kill the other chap? That's his job. When you put, as they said, the army mm. in a civil situation. This is not his training. His training is to defend the motherland, Jai Hind, mm. against the enemy. His training is not to be used in civil action. And any number of reports have said the army, the occasion should be minimum where the army is used in defense of civil authority anywhere. Because the soldiers move in a section strength, they're, they're not Delhi police with a lati. They're not used to first uh, abuse them, then chase them with a the lati, then do tear gas, and if required, shoot in the air, and mostly catch them and give them one tight slap, as they say. So when the army is put, whether it's Kashmir or anywhere else, mm. and I really thank God that they have not been put in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, in that bell theater. Yeah. And certainly, I am so happy government has not obeyed some some nuts uh, advice that we straff all these people from there or, 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 or use naval guns or whatever. So when you put the army in a situation of the police, mm -hmm. then these questions arise. And that's a really good point. Yeah. No, and I completely agree with what John is saying. I think uh, one of the issues that we must focus on when we discuss the rights of soldiers is who, what or who is causing our lethal force, our lethal military force to be deployed in areas where civil administration and police must prevail. Mm. And that is the first human rights of the armed forces that has been violated. That you start deploying them without adequate scrutiny about the failure of civil administration. Heads don't roll, questions don't get asked about why the police in Haryana abrogate the responsibility and the army has to move in and 20 people have to die. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen obviously in, in, in our democracy is that the focus swiftly moves to the 20 people dying at the hands of lethal force unleashed by the army. But the real discourse should be, why was the army deployed there? Why is a soldier who's trained only to defend and unleash lethal force being put in a situation where he is not equipped to do, deal with uh, his own compatriots, his own countrymen. Why, why did the situation come to such yeah, a pass? Why does it come to such a pass and why is the civil administration and the police not being uh, held to account? So I would like the discourse to move there. Why is the, uh, in this discourse of rights and human rights, why are we not asking questions about who is accountable for this kind of corroding of the police and the civil administration? I think that's brilliant yeah, report, absolutely. Yeah, add to what Rajiv has said, I think first of all, I hope your fellow parliamentarians <laughs> are listening to what you're saying because rarely do we find this kind of lucidity on this subject even in parliament. So that's point one. Then but we should let speak me, more in parliament. <laughs> if he gets a chance. <laughs> Ask some more time. But let me add this Priya, which is that why is the Indian army being deployed? I think it's a fair question to ask. We all agree that it's not desirable. But there is a reality, which is that India is in a very complex security situation. And it goes back really, I would say, to end 80s, early 90s, when we perhaps are the only country in the world where a neighbor with nuclear weapons is actually investing in terrorism against us. Mm. So this is a proxy war. I often say that Indians forget that this proxy war started in January of 1990. 
So we are more than 26 years down the road, we don't recognize it. And that is the reason why progressively you find that the deployment of the Indian Army in particular in relation to JNK and the entire border with Pakistan has increased. And over the years, I do want to say in defense of the Indian Army that they have acquired very high levels of competence in dealing with this situation where your proxy war, the external, has now in a way got into the internal dimension. And Jammu and Kashmir is the classic example. And Madhya Pradesh where we've been faulted, I think. Next. There was also the Northeast. Long before, yeah. lo long before JNK, yeah. there was the Northeast. The, I just uh, when, when the, for the first time, sir, you would recall, the Air Force was deployed. Even now, in museums there, in the houses and elsewhere, you will find shells and all sorts of stuff used. I want to add people. a last line and defer to Mono. I am seeing in this particular program, Priya, I hope it is, you know, people sort of tune into this. The politician in India has abdicated, meaning that we have a proxy war for 26 years. Uh. The soldier has done his bit and more. Mm. And if you look just at Jammu and Kashmir, I want to say this unambiguously, on the 70th anniversary of Indian independence, the Indian politician has abdicated when it comes to national security, particularly in reference to JNK. We have gone for short-term gains, but I'll still defer to Mono. And also, Mr. Nalun, why you answer the his question? And has one failed, more. Actually. That's failed. And you know, I just had a in recent interview with uh, Rama Adha when we were discussing that question of pellets uh, versus, you know, should, why were soldiers using pellets? And his thing was, he said, when we said soft option, that doesn't mean we're going to shower them with, pellet, uh, with petals. How else do we handle the situation? So, something on that also. How else do they handle the situation? Well, you know, I, I, I just want to add to what uh, Uday, Rajiv, and John have been saying. And we have to be very careful not to mix. Uh, totally dissimilar groups of people together. Mm. Now you have protesters, for example, protesting against price rise, against unemployment, against societal evils. That's one sort of protester. And especially they're doing it in a non-violent way. That's certainly one type of protester. Mm. But then you have individuals who are funded by another country. Mm. And frankly, by an army which puts jihad at, as its motto. The Pakistan army makes no secret of the fact that it's got terror groups operating. It's got as, as auxiliaries, it's got jihad, it's fighting a, a, a war against India. So these individuals cannot be looked at as normal protesters. Yes. And clearly the fact of the matter is, as you know, Uday correctly said, mm -hmm. internal and external security come together because the external threat has now come inside. Now, in ISIS, for example, the external threat has come to every single city in Europe and the United States. So there has to be a difference in dealing with normal protest and dealing with extraordinary protest. I want to add to the point of what Rajiv was making. In Haryana, what happened? I mean, I talked to people who were involved in this agitation and they were saying they got a clear signal from the authorities that the police are being told not to really intervene in force. In the case of Kashmir yes, also, exactly. regrettably, the protesters were clearly told, come out on the streets, we'll make sure the police don't, quote unquote, hassle you or whatever. Now then, this kind of a situation is tailor-made for the troublesome elements, for the terrorist elements, for the armed and disruptive violent elements to take advantage of. So I think it's extremely unfair on the police as well, as well as the army, when the authorities say, don't intervene, just go there and don't do anything because it is demoralizing the police, it's demoralizing the armed force. We saw that in Haryana. There was chaos in Haryana yes. because of the mobs knew nothing was going to happen to them until finally it was too late, as Rajiv said. And the same thing happened in Kashmir. The mobs were allowed to grow because a clear signal was given to them. Don't worry, the police are just going to stand by. They may not throw rose petals at you, but they're just going to stand by. Haryana is a very complex example because the, I go back to this point that the rights of the Indian soldier are being shrunk and trampled and you saw this in Haryana. The ignominy of the Indian army being deployed because civil administration collapses and then they go there and they have to carry a banner saying we are Indian army. Why? Because progressively the state has allowed the credibility and even the image of the Indian soldier to be diluted. You allow paramilitary, you allow police to have rank badges, insignia, and make them look like the military, which we've always said Very 40 years ago, going Very back dangerous. to Mrs. Gandhi's time, that this was dangerous. Huh. Yet, the lobbies that work in this country against the rights and the competence of the military allowed this to happen. Let it be said very clearly on your show. The military is a professional force that uses force in defense of state. Officers in the armed forces command their men. Like Monu says, in Kargil, they go and lead from the front. Mm. 
and police only and superintendents at best you have a superintendent of police hmm. they don't command they do law and order i am not in any way trying to cast aspersions on the role of the police a democracy hmm. needs police for law and order but don't mix the two and don't dilute your military's image competence credibility and shrink their rights that is critical and in favor of whom raji before in i bring you in we need to take a quick break but stay with us Welcome back to the News X Sunday Guardian Roundtable. Today we are here discussing the rights of our soldiers. Rajiv, before the break, you know we were having a discussion on basically how the we don't treat our military and army, give them the respect that they deserve. So I know you've been doing a lot of work on this. No, look, I think we must accept without any ambiguity that the only remaining functioning institution in this country is the armed forces. It has become, yes. it's gone from the last line of defence to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth lines of defence. and so therefore while a discourse on human rights violations and discourse and scrutiny of the armed forces and all of what they do is is appropriate and i i never say no to that but we must understand the importance of the armed forces in the current context of where we are today every other institution in our governmental system has failed is failing is getting corroded is getting politicized is getting ethnically divided and this is the only institution we have left mm. so to treat that institution with some amount of cares with some amount of uh, passion with some amount of amount of uh, consideration is empathy. not uh, empathy is not yes. asking for too much nobody is saying they should not be held to account nobody is saying they should not be scrutinized nobody is saying questions should not be asked but to allow them to become a punching bag because they as a disciplined force cannot go on tv shows they can't go have press conferences they can't go into a seventh pay commission and say anything they give a memorandum to the seventh pay commission and the bureaucrats turn it down without giving them one word in clarification on why it's being turned down where discipline is being used against them i think we should be very careful that we have one institution left let us start building it improving it caring for it because a lot of what our future as a nation is going to go through given what udai just said about the asymmetric threats that we have will depend upon the motivation morale capability competence of our armed forces and that is just saying it as it is there is no need for me to say anything more so so the debate on human rights ought to be the debate on the rights of the armed forces the larger debate on human rights should be a debate that should be there it should be well preserved it should be evidence based nobody is arguing against that but don't trash the armed forces don't make them a punching bag and don't make them a camouflage for the failures of our political system and the administrative system okay i know you want to come up i'm a professor alapati you know what he says uh, uh, they should not be camouflage but at the end of the day when there are protests you know when people are hurling rocks at the army what do they do the soldiers hit back they are given pellets to hit back that becomes a huge political issue well frankly the you know the notion of soldiers being given air guns and pellets hmm. would be absurd in any context if you ask me very frankly soldiers are there for a specific purpose and the soldier has got to be trained to use lethal force you are supposing god forbid there's a war if it comes back to india in some you know hostile neighbor the soldier has got to be geared to attack with the full force of of his nature and his command so what do you do in a situation like this 50 days plus more off curfew well the the fact is you know i mean uh, john was talking in terms of strafing and bombing and mm. talking in terms of he the reality of situation is we have to isolate the the terror elements we have to isolate the the very the pakistan sponsored elements and we have to take the most ruthless action against them and action very frankly in such a way that they know that the might of the indian state is such that they can never achieve this goal now the problem we are facing in india is that we are doing things half heartedly so they still half believe that they can get what they want when they cannot i just quickly just quickly one point i just want you to remember one thing when the army is deployed there somebody has already called that area a disturbed area mm. so we have already acknowledged that there is, that there is a problem mm. and only then the army goes there the army is not creating the problem they are sent there after there is a great grand announcement okay. that that particular area is a disturbed area 
and nobody I else can solve it but point. the army. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I want to pick up uh, from him. Uh, and by the way, may I compliment you on the manner of this discussion? I think it's because Commodores don't scream as much <laughs> as retired generals. Uh, 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 but uh, the point, I mean, if I may take up from there, here was a situation many, many years ago, which was really, really disturbed. Secession was in the air and it was touch and go. Mm. And yet it's such a, to use this corny phrase, integral part of India. There's comparative peace. People are in parliament. They're discussing everything. The same happened in Punjab. And I, well, let me just on the record put the fact that a couple of hundred of them have been in a way pardoned in the last one week. Yes. Uh, and, are now, and are now making merry in the Punjab. So never use the army, as he says, for what they're trained, but never shift focus and spotlight and urgency from the civilian discourse, from the discussions, from the dialogue, from the embrace. Never do that. Can I add one line since you asked, what should we do? Mm, I mean, it is yeah. cause for great concern that today in JNK, in the valley in particular, for 50 days plus, the situation and the fact that 60 plus people, 65 I think last count, have lost their lives is something that every Indian is very concerned about. What should we do? I think one long-term suggestion is the Indian military or the entire security gamut, police, paramilitary and the Indian military can create a situation of temporary stability, meaning put the violence down. But after that, when we talk about the political process and the societal process, get the spiritual leaders of Jammu and Kashmir to talk about the Sufism, etc., etc., my earnest suggestion today is please get military people who have an experience of JNK on the ground. I am not asking for any dilution of current hierarchies. We accept political supremacy, etc. But there is a reservoir of retired personnel across the board, from the subedar major to the general, mm. who have dealt with JNK on the ground. We have 20 years, but Priya, for 20 years we have said, let the retired community go there mm. and populate the valley, put mm. schools, hospitals, not the serving military. Mm. So this is a variation of giving the soft touch and providing an ecosystem so that the local people, you know, whenever the Indian Army has done this, the rest of the system has not given them the kind of support yeah. they need. So That's my repeat point. point, get the retired community, get the Subedar Major Sahib. We have spiritual leaders in the armed forces, you know that. We have a church, we have a masjid, we have a temple. Those people can be put into the valley after they've left the service and, what's the word, irrigate the ecosystem. Well, it's ba I'm sorry, they're totally out of time, but I can see the solution also lies back to the army, as they, they so nicely put it. But that's it from us. Thank you for watching this edition of Roundtable. We'll see you again, same time, next week.